The Democratic machine has done an incredible job of making sure that they stay in power in perpetuity, no matter what happens with elections. I mean, elections are important, don't get me wrong. But even if the Democrats lose the elections, their power brokers are still in place. Welcome back to The Kevin Roberts Show. We have a special, very special bonus episode because this guest this week is someone probably all of you know because he's on Fox News a lot. He served the United States Congress for the better part of a decade from the great state of Utah, a very close friend of Heritage Foundation and Heritage Action, and someone who's become a good friend of mine. It is a such a pleasure, former Congressman Jason Chaffetz, to have you here. Thank you. Oh, Kevin, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. So we're going to talk about a lot of things. You and I catch up often. And in fact, I was on uh, on your podcast recently. We kind of covered the, the the gamut. But with the time that we have, Jason, we're going to talk about something that's very exciting to me. I know it's got to be exciting to you. And that's a, a new book that you have out. And that book is extremely timely because, well, let me just read the title for our audience. The Puppeteers, the People Who Control the People Who Control America. This is a book that's come out very recently in the last couple of days, published by Broadside of HarperCollins. And the reason that I say that it's timely is because you cover the waterfront regarding why America is in the shape that it's in. And I, I know I can speak for you when I say that, like me, you're an optimist, but you're also a realist. And when you were in Congress, chair of the Oversight Committee, you probably saw the, the ugliest of the ugly. We'll get to that, but let's first talk about the book. Why the book? Well, the the closer I got to how government actually works, the, the more scared I got. Um, and then uh, it, through the years, I have just come to understand that the Democratic machine has done an incredible job of making sure that they stay in power in perpetuity, no matter what happens with elections. I mean, elections are important. Don't get me wrong. But even if the Democrats lose the elections, their power brokers are still in place. And that's what scares me. I mean, uh, it, and you only have to look at this most recent debt ceiling fight. Uh, we were talking about less than 10 percent of the overall federal budget. That's what was in play, because you have uh, mandatory programmatic spending, you had defense spending, and you had the uh, money that we have to spend servicing the debt, the interest payments. And so when you're what you're left with is less than 10 percent. And so you have this bureaucratic class that is running the show. You have outside big dark money groups that are pulling all the levers and it relegates the members of Congress and the House and the Senate to dealing with a very, very small amount of money and a very, very small uh, amount of the power. So if you think, if anybody thinks that Joe Biden and Kamala Harris are in there pulling all the strings, I mean, come on, he doesn't have the cognitive capability to pull that off. But there are a lot of people behind the scenes that like him in that place because guess what? They can do what they want to do, and they're the ones implementing the policy, whether we like it or not, by these unelected people who really rule, rule the roost. Well, that's, uh, I think, a real accurate and succinct summary of the problem. I mean, I, you travel the country a lot, as I do, and, and, and you try to spend as much time with, as I call them, everyday Americans. Uh, there are some everyday Americans in D.C., but there are a lot more of them outside the swamp. But it, it, it leads me to the, the question that I got last week on, on one of the, the stops that I made in Texas. And it was, Kevin, think about historically people like and this this person just used examples of Democrat presidents, Andrew Jackson, Franklin Roosevelt, John Kennedy, Bill Clinton, to some extent, they they put their mark on the Democrat Party and the power brokers of the Democrat Party. In the case of Joe Biden, the opposite is true, that he has been shaped and fashioned and created very late in, in life by them. That's a real problem. And, and, and it seems to me that your book is, is an explanation of how that could be so. Yeah, it's because these power brokers have figured out how to fund the government without Congress ever touching it. Um, for instance, the mandatory programmatic spending, which is 75 percent of our budget, it's not just Medicaid, Medicare, and Social Security. There are hundreds of other programs that do that. And Congress doesn't even, it never even touches that. 
And then when the Democrats put their people in place, remember, it's something like north of 95 and in some cases close to 100 percent of donations from these departments and agencies go to the Democrats. It's no wonder why they're able to continue on in perpetuity with with no pushback whatsoever. Uh, Think about the Inflation Reduction Act. That was a bill where literally three hundred and seventy four billion dollars was set aside in this green slush fund um, that's controlled by John Podesta. So who do you think holds more power and in, in able to manipulate markets and do things uh, with uh, power brokers? John Podesta has a slush fund of three hundred and seventy four billion dollars to hand out. And that's just but one example in the book. And the, the, the book is how do they fund it? Who are all the people and the players? Susan Rice is one of the most powerful people. I know she's she's just left government, but what she did while she was there, it pretty it's very scary as, as we outlined in the Puppeteers book. So one of a of two follow-up questions at that point. Another question I get often from from friends around the country is Kevin, considering the cognitive decline of President Biden and well, I'll be polite. And Vice President Harris, I won't I won't uh, explain what I think. Who's running the country? It seems as if the answer to that or some of the answers to that question are Susan Rice, John Podesta. These are people who've been around multiple administrations, right? They're 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 unfortunately excellent examples of the problem you've identified. Yeah, Brian Deese. Brian Deese worked for BlackRock. He, he's a climate activist. And then he was in charge of the Economic Council there for Biden. He worked for Obama before that. Uh, this guy was controlling more of what goes on, and he's toggling in and out of government. And there's just Gary Gensler at the Securities and Exchange Commission. I mean, their goal is has everything to do with diversity, equity, and inclusion and the ESG rules. It's not about maximizing shareholder value or or helping uh, the average Americans in their in, in their uh, their returns on their investments. It has nothing to do with that. It has everything to do with control and with power. And and these are the types of people that are the puppeteers behind the scenes. And there's big money behind those people. Yeah, yeah. It's it, There are many levels to this. So the second follow-up question is, at what point did you realize the scope and scale of this problem? I mean, was this recently? Was it at, at, in some particular moment during your service in Congress? Uh, I think it was while I was in Congress and my eyes were really open because I had four principles when I ran. Fiscal discipline, limited government accountability, and a strong national defense. And I figured if I got those four things right, we'd be moving in the right direction. But remember, when I was elected, you know, back in 2008, we were talking about an $8 trillion deficit uh, or, or debt, I should say. And now we're over 30. It just spins more and more out of control and nobody wants to touch it. Nobody. And that's where I started. Look at all the money that is going out the door and the money with the money comes the control. And unless you starve the beast, these people, these puppeteers get stronger and stronger. How do we starve the beast? I mean, I just you and I on our minds uh, are the recent is the recent debt ceiling fight. We understand the the limited leverage that the speaker had, but just pure, as I mentioned to him, you know, just purely from a from an ideas policy point of view, put the politics off to the side. Um, it, it best case scenario, just being polite, um, that's not going to do much to change the trajectory towards starving the beast. We don't necessarily have to have a conversation about the debt ceiling. I'm just the recent debt ceiling issue. I'm just using that as, a, as an example that Washington seems incapable of correcting the problem itself. Yeah, I I do believe that you have to starve the beast. And if you don't spend less, if you don't have serious reforms on that mandatory programmatic spending that's out there um, and start to peel those away. I mean, one of the stories in the book is they created the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. And I understand it's going been going through the courts here. But they the Democrats funded that not through Congress. They funded that through the Federal Reserve. So they were never subject to anything for, that was happening to Congress. They didn't have to answer our our subpoenas. They didn't have to answer our testimony. It needs to come testify. And these people had regulatory control so they could start fining companies and organizations and then using those funds to actually give them to their select non for, not-for-profit do-good you know entities that they liked. You've got to cut that off. I mean – 
they are literally have hundreds of billions of dollars, not just the CFPB, but others as well, that they use in these slush funds where they there is no adjudication process. They literally hold these people, these corporations ransom, take those funds, give them to their own organizations that they see fit, and then either sue the government or pursue their other their other um, avenues. Um, it, as far as a, as far as the solution, the book talks about this a lot because the states are really going to have to step up and do this. I really like what Glenn Youngkin is doing, and we talk about how. He changed diversity, equity, and inclusion to diversity opportunity. And when he changed that, that equity to opportunity, it was a really hard argument to fight against. But suddenly he started fighting for the unborn. What is their, un, what is their opportunities? And it's just cha- it's been a game changer there in Virginia. And I think others around the country should replicate that and do that. So it's a complicated answer. That's why it takes a book to do it. But you got to starve the you got to starve the beast. No, it's good. I mean, I, I will just say from from having reviewed the book in the last few days that it's an excellent, although troubling, analysis of the problem, right? Troubling because the problem is is really so deep, as you mentioned. But you also mentioned some great solutions, and 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 certainly the top of the list is one that you and I agree vehemently about, and that's the role of the states. And just to inject some optimism into this realistic analysis. I would argue, Jason, tell me what you think, that in 2023, as we sit here about midway point of the year, this is the greatest year for conservative policy reform at the state level. We can look at you know, what Governor Yunkin has already done in Virginia. As a Virginia resident, I'm grateful. I think once he's able to, to uh, maybe wrest control of the Senate from the other side, next year is going to be even better in terms of policy. But look at what other states have done across the map on universal school choice, on confronting environmental social governance nonsense, on immigration, on, on, on spending. I mean, this whole concept of a conservative budget is one that many states, more than a dozen states, have adopted. So I respond to that because I, I, don't, I don't believe that my optimism there is hollow. In fact, I, we think at Heritage that the states are really leading the way. They, they really is. They, I think they, they have the ability to sue people, to draw them into court. Uh, those those attorneys general have got to get out there and do their job. One of the most, I think, revealing, never seen before stories that you'll see in the puppeteer's book is about the state treasurers. Now, normally this is a very sleepy type of race, right? Who's paying to attention or can even name their state treasurer, right? But the Democratic state treasurers take a very different approach. They pour a lot of money into this. And they they literally have a document that we got our hands on. No, nobody else has ever kind of seen this before. And um, is they had this corporate benefits package that they put out trying to entice these corporations to put in 50 or or $100,000. And their pitch is state treasurers, Democratic state treasurers control over $1 trillion. That in just California alone, they control about $750 billion. And they use those proxy votes to go into these companies and force them to engage in this ESG and DEI types of activities. And so, again, part of starving the beast is the idea that where is the money? The states are controlling trillions of dollars in retirement funds. You got to pay attention to that if you're actually going to solve the problem and get rid of very policies that cause so many of the problems. Yeah, and it, and it seems again it's continuing down this path of of optimism, but also the the real examples of the the last few years of state officials taking great action. That if we can continue this trajectory, have more state treasurers, for that matter, more attorneys general and governors taking on this this problem that you mentioned. That is the massive amount of of public funds controlled by so many left of center statewide officials. If we can continue to make inroads there and the 2024 election cycle goes reasonably well, neither you nor I making an endorsement by, by saying that, if it just goes well for conservatism, it seems as if all eyes will be on Congress in January 2025, which leads me to the question. And I get this question, too, from a lot of people around the country. OK, Kevin, we buy into your optimism. State policy is going well. 24 cycle goes well. Best case scenario. 
we're we're back at the same problem, which is that Congress doesn't have a lot of incentive to correct these problems. What what do you think will change that assessment, Jason? Especially given your experience, um, you have to have a strong president who is willing to get rid of the bureaucratic class. I I tell a story, and it and it goes like this in the book. There's a member of Congress who goes and he meets. He wants to go meet with the cabinet secretary. He shows up at the meeting. Guess what? Cabinet secretary is not there, but the senior staff is there. And finally, the member of Congress gets fairly upset and says, okay, I'm not meeting with the B team. I want to meet with the, the cabinet secretary. And if I'm just going to meet with the B team, I'm leaving. And finally, one of the senior staff perks up and says, you're right. Uh, we are the B team. We be here before you. We be here after you, and we be the ones to actually make the decisions around here. And there's a lot of truth to that, Kevin. If you don't have a strong president who's able to clear out all those political appointees, then you're not going to solve the problem. I, I talked to a cabinet secretary who came in with Trump, and he said the problem was I got there, and then I was the secretary, but my entire department and agency was full of Hillary Clinton supporters. I couldn't get anything done because it was just all, they knew they could outweigh me. Yeah, and, and uh, as, as you know, because you're, you're involved in this, our, our Project 2025, the Presidential Transition Project Heritage is facilitating for the conservative movement, 60 other organizations, 400 policy scholars involved. The most important part of that is that personnel database into which several thousand people will submit their resumes and their names because we, we can no longer as conservatives afford the situation where it's just the secretary, maybe his or her couple of deputies who are right-minded confronted by this permanent bureaucratic class. Yeah, that, that is, there are literally thousands and thousands of appointments that a president gets to make. Um, and again, you got to cut their budgets. You got to starve the beast. And look, we haven't even really started to talk about something I know that's dear to your heart, the Department of Justice and the Federal Bureau of Investigation. If you don't revamp that top to bottom and say, all right, we got to start over here. Um, these are some critical things that we have to do, like counterintelligence, but they're being used as political weapons. But I'm telling you, and you know this, Kevin. This same type of approach is happening in every department and agency. It's not just the FBI. It's not just the DOJ. It's happening from commerce to, to the to you know interior to the SEC. I mean, you name it, it's going on. No, it it is. Heck, we we could do an entire podcast episode just talking about the Department of Justice and FBI. Maybe maybe we'll do that down the road. But actually, it's a it's a really good segue, Jason into a question I wanted to ask you, both for the purposes of our audience, borrowing from your, your expertise in oversight, you know, both capital O oversight, the oversight committee, but also oversight generally, but also it's related to the book. And I, I can only presume that some of your experience as chairman of the House Oversight Committee fueled your interest in writing the book. This is the question. What, what was the most troubling example that you discovered of overreach by the bureaucracy when you were chairman of that committee? Well, I, I got a long list. <laughs> I know you I, do. I, I, I guess what was so frustrating is I saw the Democrats, they would issue a subpoena um, and they would get a rapid response in the Department of Justice. I had Hillary Clinton's IT person, um, Brian Pagliano, uh, who was at the State Department while she was at the State Department. And I subpoenaed his documents. Uh, he was there up on the, you know, working with the people on the seventh floor. Um, and the response I got from the State Department was this IT specialist, the entire time he was at the, the, the State Department, something like four years, he never sent nor did he ever receive any emails. And I thought, what? Wait, what? He got immunity from the Department of Justice. So I wanted to call him before the committee. Twice he didn't show up, even though we served a subpoena to him by the Department of, uh, by the U.S. Marshals. And I went back to the Department of Justice to enforce that, and they wouldn't enforce it. And until Congress actually enforces its own subpoenas, until it acts like an, a co-equal branch of government, the Department of Justice is going to run amok. I remember working with the Inspector General 
dozens upon dozens upon dozens of times he has made referrals to the Department of Justice where somebody has acted so inappropriately there might be a criminal prosecution, but he can't do that. And the Department of Justice won't police itself. And you move forward to uh, Kevin Kleinsmith, who in, you know, in dealing with Donald Trump, forged documents to put a FISA application before a court that was approved. Nothing happened. He, he was dismissed. He had to, you know, got probation, but he didn't even lose his law license, for goodness sake. And the court didn't stand up for itself. And it, it just really scares me how pervasive and how how abusive and how political that organization has become. And so it, it leads me to the question about solutions. And, and I'm reminded of the, the last chapter of your book, um, How to Take on the Puppeteers and When. You've got this, this great paragraph, which I'll just read here for the sake of our audience. Given the Democrats' overwhelming dominance of so many American institutions, it's easy to feel like the Davids of the right will never defeat the Goliaths of the left. The task before us is not a simple one but it's also not an impossible one. There are Davids all over America whose slingshots aim true. There is much we can learn from them. It it leads to a question that I often ask guests, especially guests like you who have have served in Congress, what can individual Americans do to help their member of Congress, to be active locally in, in a substantive way that in each of our roles, each of our locales can contribute to solving this problem? Yeah, I I, I think that's right. I hear the same question everywhere I go across the country. Being involved and being engaged and understanding where we need to fight, because sometimes we're over here bickering about something that, quite frankly, ain't going to make a hill of beans worth of difference. And uh, people have to understand in their local races that district attorney matters, that school board matters. The, the, The state treasurer as I reveal in here, they're controlling trillions of dollars. That actually matters. Um, And your attorney general matters. And certainly at the national level, yeah, we need to make sure that Congress has the backbone to actually go out and do what it needs to do. So that's why I love Heritage. Heritage, I think, is by far the best, far and away, in terms of, of actual policy. But we need to know what we're trying to fight for. And if we don't starve the beast and and implement people in there that have are fair-minded, then we can't get to the finish line. And um, being involved and engaged, and knowing where to fight, I think that's a, a huge part of it. That's that's my off-the-cuff reaction to your your question, but it's it is the most salient question. No, it's great, great, great answer. I I appreciate that. I know our audience will as well because it's it's top of mind for them. And it, and I think that. You know whether it's it's someone who is just completely focused on local politics in Utah or Texas or Florida or wherever, or someone who will occasionally get up here to D.C. and and visit with their member of Congress, maybe other members of Congress because they're they're active on a particular issue. Everyone is is saying this. Everyone on the political right is saying this. Kevin, we understand that Heritage, for example, works on all the policy issues, and we need you to do that. But we need to know which policy priorities at the right time. And that's that's hard, right, in politics, because we don't, in policy, we don't control all of the factors. In fact, very rarely do we control even most of the factors. I think you appreciate that more than most people. Yeah, there's 600 departments and agencies out there, um, but you better darn well know what the government is doing and not doing. And you know what? The squeaky wheel gets the grease. And I could tell you as a former member of Congress, when a constituent from your actual district shows up, you do listen to them. And um, you want him because members of Congress want to keep getting reelected. Uh, and so but being unified on what is really important, um, I'm telling you, I, I worry more about our budget. We're paying more than two billion dollars a day in interest on our national debt at this point, two billion a day. So we could talk about how we saved $1.9 billion, you know, by cutting this out of the IRS. That doesn't even cover one day of our interest payment on their national debt. Yeah. And that's, and that's the scale of it. And, and unfortunately, just hang on this for a moment, lost in the debt ceiling commentary, regardless of where someone is on that, that particular issue, 
The fact is that on January 1st, 2025, roughly the date that that this this deal will get us to, we'll have four trillion dollars more in debt. We'll be well into the 30 trillions. And as our my economist colleagues at Heritage reminded me last night as I was talking to them, they said, Kevin, that's best case scenario. It it may very well be even worse. <laughs> so on that happy note, Jason, uh, we're gonna make a real uh, sort of forceful segue into an optimistic question. I think you know that I've got the custom at the end of of all of these interviews with people, even though we've talked about realism, that I ask, in spite of all those problems, in spite of all of those challenges, uh, I, I know you well enough to know you woke up today optimistic about the future of America. And why is that? It's the greatest country on the face of the planet. It, it, it really is. I, I look at... Um, my loved ones, our youngest daughter, I told you just before we got on, you know, this podcast, I just said, you know, our youngest daughter just got married. And all three of our kids were very blessed. They, they got married. Uh, they've, they're have they each now married. It's such a life moment. I have four grandkids. I can't even believe it. And I look at their optimism and their future. And I think, wow, the world they're going to grow up in is so different than the world I grew up in. And And, but I still see that optimism. And there's something about America and the promise of America. But we got to pass that to the next generation. And I worry about, I worry about artificial intelligence. I worry about our government. I worry about China on the march. I mean, there's a lot that grandpa, papa gets to worry about, but I still see that optimism. And I just know that somehow, some way, every generation has figured it out and we will figure it out as well. That optimism is inherent in Americans. It's inherent in humans. It's it's profound in Americans, and it's it's so great to, um, you know, take that question in a very human and personal way as dad and grandfather. Well, Jason Chavitz, I, I mean this. You know that I don't do patronizing things. I, I mean it. You know, from not just myself, but from all of us at Heritage. Thank you for being one of the great gentlemen, and statesmen, and patriots of our age. I encourage everyone in the audience to buy the book. Uh, that's not something Jason's forcing me to do, although I know he and his publisher appreciate that. Heritage uh, would not say that if we didn't believe that the book is really important. And uh, thanks for making the time, Jason, to join us. Oh, thanks, Kevin. A real pleasure. I appreciate it. And to those of you in the audience who make this show and all of our work at Heritage possible, thanks for joining this episode of The Kevin Roberts Show. We will be back next time with another patriot of our age. Take care.